I am an immigrant. Uh, I am ethnically Kashmiri, which is what Pakistan and India keep fighting over. Kashmir comes from Kashmir. Led Zeppelin's second best song is also Kashmir. And I was born in Pakistan. I uh, lived a lot in Saudi Arabia, spent a few years in Japan, went back to Saudi Arabia, did my eighth grade in Houston, did my high school and university in Toronto. I retired for five years. I lived in the States and South America. And then seven years ago, I came back to Toronto. And the reason I tell you this is because my worldview tends to be a little bit different than most people. At the same time, I am incredibly old. I've been in the tech scene now for 17 years. So I've seen the dot-com bubble burst in the late 90s. I've seen Web 2.0 come out. I saw the recession. I saw Silicon Valley heat up once, you know, Airbnb and Uber and all that came around. And I was just in San Francisco, and the bubble is definitely bursting. And as Chris mentioned, I've done quite a few different companies. My original one was in online gaming. Uh, that did very well. My second one was in local search. And my third, most recent one, is called examine.com. And what we do at examine.com is we analyze scientific research around nutrition and supplements. We're the unbiased source. We don't sell any supplements. We don't do any coaching. We don't do any clients. I hate human beings. We don't need to make money from them. We are an education company. At the same time, we're very well known. We get about 50 to 60,000 visitors a day. We get quoted in the mainstream all the time. And we're not just talking about like men's health or men's fitness. We're talking about New York Times, written for, the Mother, uh, for Mother Jones. We've written for The Guardian. We're, we are very well known. And so we're a profitable company. You know, we're firmly in seven figures. And other people hear about this. And we get emails like this. You know, they want to invest in our company. They want to go anywhere from $50,000 to $10 million. And you know, they use all the buzzwords. My favorite one is they're going to juice up our operations. You don't know what that means. So I tell my friends this. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, got, I think we've had 18 people come to me to invest in examine.com. And we're a little bit over five years old now. And I tell my buddies this, and this, this is what they think is going to happen. Boom, I'm going to live the baller lifestyle. And you can tell I'm a little bit old. I have Dre and Snoop Dogg instead of like Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Or, or Drake, even though he's from Toronto. And you know, they come to me, and my friends think I've, I've got it made. I'm going to you know, take this money. I'm going to juice my operations. I'm going to go from five million. You know, we're worth about five million, let's say. I'll go to 25, 40 million dollars. I'll sell it. Huge money. Right? I will live the baller life. But I've always said no. And that's kind of what this talk is really about. So you heard me yesterday, and I was a little bit more blunt than I normally am. But I am very big on the work-life balance. I'm very big on enjoying life more than just trying to become e-famous or making a lot of money. So before, and, and you know, we heard all these inspirational talks and aspirational stuff, and really my goal here before we head into lunch is to have you mull over a few questions about why you want to get into business, why you want to do this kind of stuff. So before I even going into these questions, I want to talk about how venture capitalism is very akin to a lottery. Right, so in the average venture fund, 2% generate 98% of the returns. Literally, it is like an iceberg. So in this entire room, there's only two or three or four people that will do very well in VC, and the rest will not do so well. And these are the people that we never talk about. These are the things we never, ever consider. Right? We see all the super famous guys, but we don't actually see what happens to everyone else. So I want to go over some numbers also. So if we look at the New York Stock Exchange, about a quarter of those companies hit 50 million in revenue within six years. Everyone else took longer. So that top 25% uh, percentile, it took them six years to hit 50 million dollars. But the average VC fund is turning over every three to four years. They don't have time to wait for to generate revenue. We would not have made it. We didn't make shit for, for the first two years. You know, we're four, five years old now, we do really well, you know, but those first two years, we didn't do anything. You look at Inc., right? They talk about the 500 fastest growing companies. They found that 50% of them were started with less than $50,000. A third of them started with less than $10,000. And, and this is Inc. 500. These are talking about all kinds of companies. I've talked to a lot of people over the last few days here. A lot of them are internet-based. You don't need that much money. We keep looking at it. We found that about almost 80% of them self-funded their company. You look at those last two numbers, it's about 
use external funding to get into the 500 fastest growing companies in the US. And this is what it really comes down to, right? 84% of high growth companies did not take any VC. And so I always compare venture capitalism to being famous, to being a celebrity. You know, you always hear about those top two, three, four, five celebrities that have made it, but you never hear about all the others. So for the record, I love Beyonce. She, she enters every single one of my slides, so always, I always get it in there. So now we start asking ourselves some questions. We ask, do we really need the money? You know, I said I've been around for a long time. Things are incredibly cheap now. So this picture is literally something I used to own 11 years ago. We had a co-located cabinet in Toronto. For the nerds out there, I'm a computer engineer, so I'm a nerd too. We had 13 servers. We had two APC units. We were literally, I think, 10 feet away from Google's um, server uh, uh, cluster in Toronto. This was expensive. This was you know, five figures a year. Now we use Rackspace Cloud. Hosting is so cheap. You don't even need to pay for hosting anymore. You can just set up WordPress.com. It'll get you started immediately. Once you get your WordPress site out, you can just do free themes. They look professional. They look nice. You don't even have to go find a designer. And if you want to really get into it, there's those commercial themes. You know, they're 20, 30 bucks. They'll add really nice to it. And even if you do get a commercial theme, you use something like Bootstrap, which is like a framework to get a great design going. This is, and all of this so far has been free. Bootstrap is actually owned by Twitter. It's free. WordPress.com is free. All these themes are free. I talked about landing pages yesterday. I talked about Noah Kagan and his obsession with tacos. Right? So you do a landing page, unbounced, lead pages. I think their cheapest plans are like 9 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. That's it. Surely you can extract $20 a month somewhere. You want to get educated. You know, when I started, there was nothing like Udemy or Linda or anything like that. Now there is legitimately brilliant minds putting up courses. You can learn so much from people's experiences already. So this is a buddy of mine. He made this. Manish made this. He made a bracelet that you wear, and all it does is it vibrates and it gives you a low voltage shock. That's all it does. That's it. That's how he, you break habits. So he got, a, I think, $50,000 uh, seed originally from Bolt because it's a hardware company. But he put this on Kickstarter, $285,000 without ever having sold it to anybody. And just in the last week, he put up a alarm clock version. It just beeps now. That's all he did. It took him one year to do this. So when I put the slide up, it was 157000 60000 uh, Right before I came up here, it was at almost $200,000. New York Times covered him a few days ago. He's going to raise half a million dollars without ever having to actually have made the product for mass consumption. Kickstarter, Indiegogo are absolutely amazing. And these are like small ones. I'm just using him because he's a buddy of mine. These are small ones. Getting million dollars funding in Kickstarter is not a big deal. Sammy talked about it. They raised, I think, almost $100,000 for the mechanical arm. And once you've even raised the money and you've got your product, Facebook makes targeting so easy. Back in the day, you had to get a lot of money because you didn't know where your audience was. Facebook makes it so stupid easy, it's unbelievable. So really, again, it goes back to, right? Even if you do get the money, what do you do with it? If a VC gives you $5 million, they're expecting you to do something with it. If you gave me $5 million today and put it in examine.com's bank account, I honestly would not know what to do with it. Next thing, and this is the one that bothers me the most. Are you willing to lose control? I am incredibly independent. I cannot buy anyone telling me what to do. My board of directors for my company is one handsome man right there. That's it. <laughs> as long as I make him happy, I don't have to worry about anything else. I am so independent that I actually legally changed my name five years ago. I was like, I didn't get to choose my name. That's not cool. So I changed my name. That is my mindset. I legitimately cannot stand anyone telling me what to do. So you look at examine.com's traffic. Those first two years, we were maybe at 10% of where we are today. VC would have never taken that. I knew we had potential. I knew what we were doing. I knew there was a lot of investment, goodwill being built in. But a VC would have never, ever been OK with this. At the end of the day, studies always show that the biggest thing that impacts your stress is a lack of control in your life. And getting external money obliterates your ability to control your life. 
So then we move on, and this is something that really gets talked about, right? What is your cut once it's all said and done? Like this simple thought exercise, right? Yeah, I know 10% of 50 million is bigger than 80% of 5 million. But the real gist of it is, how much harder is it to get to $50 million? Examine.com is worth $5 million. And if I can do it, I'm pretty sure pretty much 99% of you guys can do it. But that's what it is, right? Like, if you do want to make a lot of money, you can still make a chunk of change without ever having to take a dime of external money. Heidi, she's a VC herself, and she makes a great point. People forget, they think that venture capitalism is free money, it's a grant. It's not, it's debt. They expect to be paid before you get any of your money. Heidi has a fantastic blog post where she even does a theoretical thought example of how you could raise and create a unicorn, which is a billion dollar company, and end up with zero cents yourself. And it wasn't some extreme cases, it was legitimate stuff that could actually happen. So I want to talk about my buddy. He's in Toronto. Slightly, I, I made the numbers a little bit more anonymous. But he started up a company with three other buddies of his. One of them dropped out. He got $5 million in funding. Awesome. So he grinded. He worked hard. He did that entire grit and grind and hustle and all that other garbage. He paid himself $50,000 a year. That's it, because he was aiming for something bigger. And it worked. Four years later, we barely saw him. He was exhausted and all that stuff. He sold it $11 million. Huge. It's a huge amount. But here's the reality of it, right? Once the VCs got their money back, and they're not just getting their money back, right? They want a multiple back. Once VCs got their money back, once the legal side got their money back, once it got split amongst all of his other owners and all the other employees, he ended up with half, he ended up with half a million dollars. And that's a chunk of change. That's a good chunk of change. But when you average it over those four years that he grinded, it's $175,000. And you may think, hey, you know, $175,000, that's a lot of money. But the average engineer at a high-tech company in Silicon Valley, which is where he was, makes $150,000. You work at Google, you work at Microsoft, you're making $150,000 on average. So my friend, who worked himself into this, he got really heavy. Uh, he was extremely exhausted. His social life basically disappeared. And you have the success story that he sold an $11 million company. But really, he just made $25,000 a year extra. And this, this is not a, like a specific example. This happens all the time. This is that other 98% that no one ever really talks about. And so this is a big one too, right? How much time do you have? Once you get that VC money, your life is go, go, go all the time. This, this imagery here represents your life being blurred, by the way, if that, if that imagery was a little bit <laughs> not too clear. Your life blurs. You don't have time for anything else. You know, companies like Google and Facebook, and I guess now Shopify, they're not giving you free food to be your friend. They're not doing it to be cool. They're doing it because feeding you at work keeps you at work. <laughs> Megan's a big fan right there. Uh, like, that is their job. They are sucking the life out of you. And if you saw me at, at the founders panel yesterday, you know I'm not about that life. I'm here to enjoy life. This kind of stuff is crazy. Or this is even crazier. It's a point of pride to sleep where you work. That is crazy to me. Look how uncomfortable that looks. <laughs> That's the reason I bought a really nice bed, to enjoy it. it. It always boggles my mind that people think it's a good thing to spend all your time working. You know, there's a meme called Shower Thoughts, and the idea is finally when you get in showers, when you get these amazing ideas and random thoughts. And that happens because that's finally you give your brain a break. You've got nothing to do but enjoy your soapy suds and the you know, nice stream that's hitting your chest or whatnot. Because otherwise, you're always busy trying to concentrate on stuff like this. And so what happens is you lose that balance. Your life becomes work. You don't have a work-life balance. You just have work. And so I was in San Francisco recently, and I was telling one of my, you know, I have a lot of VC friends, actually, to be honest. And we were talking about this, and I was telling them about the cookie life. So I've met about like 30 of you guys, and I've mentioned the cookie life. Be prepared. 
So, I love chocolate chip cookies. Love them. And in Toronto, I have found the best chocolate chip cookie place. It's called Le Gourmand. It's absolutely amazing. Look at that. That looks delicious. And in case you did not believe that I've truly done my chocolate chip cookie research, this is what I used to look like. <laughs> this is me about 10 years ago at Gnome Dex. As you can see, I was really styling with my haircut. You should have seen me. When I woke up, I was like, damn, everyone's going to love this. But getting back to the cookies. So I took a friend of mine to this place, and she was a doubter. She didn't believe me. And she tried this cookie, and she was like, this is amazing. You are right. And I hear that a lot. But you are right. These are the best cookies I've ever had. And I'm like, good, this, this worked out. So a week later, she posts on my Facebook wall. And she says, you know what? I found better cookies. And my obvious response was, Kara, you are an idiot. Obviously, there's something wrong with you. And out of left field, her friend Renee comes. And I've never met Renee. I've never talked to Renee before. I have no idea who Renee is. And Renee is like, you know what? I can make even better cookies. And I'm like, wow, where there was one crazy person, now there are two crazy people. <laughs> and so we had a bit of back and forth. And I said, OK, the only way we can really resolve this issue is we should have a blind taste test. <laughs> and so if you heard me yesterday when John asked the question about how focus is important, I said, it's focus and ask. You need to ask. So I asked. I said, Renee, and, and, and further continued. I said, Renee, because you came out of no, nowhere, we're going to have it at your place. I've nominated you. And you know, she did her own research. She found out I wasn't a crazy person. And so three weeks later, we had a chocolate chip cookie off. We had 18 cookies there. <laughs> That's me right there. I'm head judge 2016. You can tell I'm enjoying my cookies right there. 18 cookies. We had sorbets to cleanse our palate. We had milk. We had wine. We had water. The cookies were crazy. Someone made like miso cookies. Another one had cardamom. There was chili peppers. Of course, it was like Oreo stuffed cookies. It was insanity. It was amazing. And you can even see like it's alphabetized, so nobody knows who's, who is whose cookie. So I posted this on my Facebook wall, and I have a bit of a following because of you know, what we do in nutrition and health. And people started commenting. They, they said, I can make better cookies. And I'm like, wow, this is the easiest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, all right, send me your cookies. <laughs> Obviously. Here's the first cookie I received. This is from Laura. She's in London, Ontario. It's about a two-hour drive. She gave it to a mutual friend of mine. She drove all the way to Toronto, delivered me said cookies. And subsequently, cookies reigned in my life. And, and I leave this one up. This is, if you're in New York, this is Levain Bakery, the last one. It's considered the best chocolate chip cookies in New York. I'm sorry, Le Grimane is way better. I'm just letting you know. But the cookies kept coming. All right, and there's way more. I didn't even show, like, this, is, this slide is like a few months old. I've been traveling a lot. I was in San Francisco. Someone made me peanut butter pie. Another lady me brought me like four different variations of cookies. There was snickerdoodles, there was M&Ms, there was regular, there was peanut butter. I was in Kansas City. Someone brought me a chocolate pecan bourbon pie. It was amazing. And what's happened is, you know, I started off with my cookies originally, the cookie life, and then I branched into random stuff like pies. Right? So this, and this goes back into my work-life balance, right? This is the kind of stuff I like doing. This is enjoyable. So I was in San Francisco, and I was telling my VC buddy, and his VC friend said this, you're wasting your time and your social capital. And I swear to God, I just want to just smack him right there. Like, are you crazy? How am I wasting my time? This is amazing. This is like, who has heard of people sending other people cookies in the mail? And, and, and you can even see, it's not even just cookies. Like you can see in that bottom right corner, there's a BBQ champion of the world belt. I do a lot of fun things, dumb things. But this is what it really gets to, right? Like he had no worldview of time other than, I must make money, I must hustle, I must network, I must grind. And that's exhausting. You know, there, there are people, people like Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, they love that kind of stuff, that's great. But almost everyone I've ever met, that's not the kind of life they want. And so it really comes down to what are your goals? You know, even if you want to make $10 million, you want to make a unicorn, right, a billion dollar company, if you really ask yourself why, why do you want $10 million? Why do you want $5 million? Why do you want $100 million? What are you going to do with it? And the reality is almost all cases, you can do whatever you wanted to do at a much, much, much lower number, at a much, much lower stress level. So I talked about a similar topic about this. I talked about bootstrapping and more about unicorns and whatnot in Toronto uh, in February. And there was about 
I would say like 600 people there. One, one person tweeted at me saying, hey, I definitely want a unicorn. There was about 20 to 30 other people that tweeted at me and said, you know what, I don't. This is not the kind of life I want to lead. So when I went back and I said, you know, what are your goals? One of my goals is to travel. These are all the places I'll be traveling to in a 12-month period. I travel about 100 days a year. I'm not trying to make 10 million. I'm not, not trying to make 100 million. I love my guys. I love the company we're doing. But this is what I do. I travel. I do other stuff too. I make giant chocolate bars. <laughs> this is a foot-long Twix that I made from scratch. <laughs> and I made both of them, because you can't have one without the other. <laughs> right? Two for me, none for you. Literally, none for you. And you even look at it, that cutting board I'm cutting my awesome Twix on, I made that cutting board also. That is Jatoba and hard maple. So when you really go back to it, right, everyone wants to say, yo, I want to make a great business and I want to do this amazing kind of stuff. But if you really think about it, what are your goals? Oftentimes it's not about the money. Oftentimes it's not about making, you know, being famous or being in this magazine. Oftentimes it's about enjoying life. So that's what this talk really is about. It's not just about, you know, bootstrapping is a much better option than venture capitalism because it lets you control your life. It's really about questions you need to ask yourself about why you are doing what you are doing. So as we head off into lunch, these are the things I want you to mull over. I want you to think about how venture capitalism is basically a lottery. I want you to think about that do you even really need the money, especially with how cheap things are now? Are you willing to lose control? You obviously know I am not willing to lose control, but how much control are you willing to cede? What's your cut? You know, ownership of what you're doing, and I mentioned this again yesterday when I, was, when I was in the founders panel, I always have exits. I always control every single company I run. I trust my guys to run it, but at the end of the day, if they do anything I don't like, I can change it. I control all of it. The cut is all mine, and, and I distribute it as I want. How much time do you have? I start working at 2 p.m. every day. I work from roughly 9.30 to 10 to 2 p.m. I work out, and then I'm done for the day. And I might not be as successful as some people want to be, but in my own head, I am very, very comfortably successful. And at the end of the day, what are your goals? What are you doing? So I tell a lot of people that, you know, they want to do this personal thing or they want to do that personal thing. And I always say, tie it into your business at a minimum. Say, you know, if I make $10,000 a month, I will take a trip to Tahiti. Or if I make $100,000 a month, you know, I will buy some car that you really want or go on some vacation or rock climbing or something like that. My motto to myself is always that I'm here to make a dent. I do not need to dominate. I need to feel that my work is fulfilling and stimulating, and that is more than enough for me. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Hey. Um, we're going to take questions for uh, Saul. So I'm really glad you brought this up because up until this point in um, kind of our conference, all we've really heard about is stories and the cost of success. What is it going to cost you to get to that next level? How to do that? It is inspiring, but like you said, the trade-off is significant. So yeah. your tone was incredibly refreshing because we are human beings, and yeah. um, I hope life is more than just what we end with at the very end. And so. Um, so very, very cool that you brought that perspective. Um, you're traveling all over in the next year. I was a little bit jealous. And if you would take me with you, I would definitely tweet that out right sure, now. All right. Um, if we could make a deal, that would be incredible. <laughs> um, but are most of those trips just for fun? Or are those like, I'm stopping to interview people for business ideas or combo stuff? Uh, most of it, to be honest, is for fun. OK. Um, what I usually do is if I'm speaking at an event, I usually stay an extra few days yep. so I can just vacation and travel. Uh, this is the one exception. I've been now gone for about four weeks from home, okay. so I'm ready to just admire the shit out of my, do my dog, so I'm, I'm ready for that. But normally, my, my thing is, yeah, I stay for a few extra days uh, if I'm doing a talk. In general, though, especially all of the exotic locations, like I'm going to Kosovo later on, Colombia, uh, New Zealand, Hong Kong, yeah. those are all for myself. Okay. Those are all for fun. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome, awesome. Anybody got questions, go ahead and come up for Saul. I'd love to hear it. Go ahead. Hi, Saul. I'm Brett. Um, I love what you stand for. I'm all about that work-life balance and 
I always say there's no glory in being a workaholic because yeah. no one gets to their deathbed and says, gosh, I wish I'd worked more. Yeah. But I was wondering what you would say to someone who works in corporate America, like I do, um, and I have a lot less control over what my schedule looks like and um, you know, just I don't work for myself. So what's y your idea behind that? So I'm a, I'm a big believer in being, let's say, the digital nomad lifestyle. And what basically that's, that states is that you have an expertise in one area. And if you do a good enough job that you're so good that they can't ignore you, then people will come to you and hire you for that task. And I don't want to be mean, but you can tell that the people here are much more likely to do that than people elsewhere that are staying home because they don't have that motivation, they don't have that kind of gumption. So people ask me about this all the time, and, and I would honestly say you develop a skill set that is unique to you, you become even a freelancer if you want, and that will eventually let you wean off your corporate lifestyle and, and be able to do whatever you want. But, but, but the big important thing is you need to focus on one thing. You know, when I, I was showing uh, my buddy Manisha's um, Pavlock and his shot clock, so we have a mutual friend who's literally her job is she does crowdfunding, that's it. And so she is the one in charge of this. She's the one who got him in New York Times. That is what she's known for. So now she can work wherever she wants, and people come to her all the time saying, will you please run my Indiegogo or Kickstarter campaign? So I would definitely say focus on one thing, become the source, the person for that, and, and hopefully that will lead you to the liberation you desire. Yeah, that's really, really good. Hey, I'm Andrew. Um, my question is, going back to the crowdfunding, um, do you think it's necessarily the idea or the person's network that contributes to the amount of money that's raised? It's obviously both, right? I mean, if you have an interesting idea, or even if you sometimes have a dumb idea, I don't know if you saw the potato salad thing that happened last year. I think that guy raised like $100,000 to make a potato salad. So <laughs> ideas can go a very long way, but the reality is, eh, and this goes into the general scheme of the internet, people think that once they build it, it's gonna come out, or people are gonna love it, that's not how the internet works, right? You need to contact people, you need to let them know what they're doing. So when I was mentioning about my friend, that's what she does. She identifies, okay, you know, so the last one she did was a uh, fingerprint-based lock. So it's really popular with guys who go to gyms, right? And so she found people in fitness, and which is how I originally connected with her. She found people in fitness, she found people who do locks, she found people who do tech, and she contacted them. And if you have an interesting idea, people respond. They love talking about crazy things. You know, this shot clock thing is ridiculous. Stephen Colbert covered it, Jimmy Fallon covered it, because it's a ridiculous idea. So I would definitely put more weight in the idea than in just the network. Oh, go ahead. Stop. Um, so as far as when you're traveling, you know, you're, going, you're traveling the world, you're doing life. I know a lot of us, it's, it can be really easy to want to take control and just like, you know, manage everything, like be on our phone all the time and right. you seem very present. Um, I guess for you, how do you, how do you delegate stuff to where you can run a company, you know, from afar and, and still do everything that you want to and enjoy life and be present, but yet, um, you know, manage, manage a company? Right, so, I mean, if you think about it, you're hiring people that are better than you at that specific task, right? And to micromanage them is honestly being a terrible boss, right? If, so Kamal Patel, he runs examine.com. He's got a double MBA, MPH, which is a master's in public health from Hopkins, and he was doing his PhD in nutrition before we, we were able to get him. So why the hell would I get in his way and tell him how to run things when he knows more than me? Like, I think biggest thing is people can't keep their ego in check. And thankfully, I don't know, maybe because I had a big family or maybe because I'm an immigrant, my ego tends not to be too big when it comes to work. Everything else, I have a huge ego. But when it comes to work, you know, I trust them to do what they do. And so I mentioned yesterday in the Founders panel, he's been running for two, two and a half years, and I just met him 10 days ago. Right? So you have to trust these guys, otherwise why would you hire them? If you don't trust them to run it, don't hire them. I think that's just the, that should be your philosophy for hiring. With that model, though, that was one of my questions, too, is how do you keep your employees motivated and give them real-time feedback? So we do monthly meetings, okay. so we, everyone's on the same strategic plan. In terms of motivation, the honest truth is, you know, they are the ones who become famous in that industry. Okay. So if you go to examine.com's about page, I'm the seventh person listed. You would have no idea who the hell I was. You'd be scrolling, oh, look at this tool, keep moving, keep moving, right? So he becomes famous 
through examine.com. So Kamal, for example, he's been on, like I said, New York Times, written for The Guardian, written for Mother Jones. His motivation is he has become a subject matter expert. Yeah. So now he speaks at nutrition conferences, he speaks at supplement conferences, he, t he speaks at health conferences yeah. because he is the expert. So that's kind of the motivation is where they are the ones shining bright. Most people think he owns examine.com, yeah. and I'm okay with that. Yeah. And that's kind of their, their intrinsic motivation is, and, and I mean, plus the, the reality is once you get bigger, there's a bigger responsibility, right? When we're impacting the health of 50 to 55,000 people or 60,000 people a day, you take it a bit more um, seriously. Yeah, yeah, very good. You said you worked a couple hours a day. What was the times again? So I, I work from roughly 9 to 2 p.m. I do, I'm a big believer in deep work, which is a, a book that Cal Newport wrote called Deep Work. Um, and basically what it is that you focus for 30 to 90 minutes, yeah. nothing else exists. Um, I have no social media, for example, on my phone. I do not get distracted by other things. I put on some like light Hans Zimmerman, for example, if you wish, yeah. some Superman uh, soundtrack or Batman or whatever, some inst instrumental music, and I just focus on my work. And once I'm done with that 30 to 90 minute task that I've assigned myself, I mean, I mess around. I spend 30 minutes reading about sports or wasting time yeah. on Facebook or whatnot, but then I get back to work. So I, I find, you know, people talk about working for 10 hours a day, but if you actually distill to the actual amount of work they do, yeah. it's usually not as much as they think. Yeah. Or it's busy work, and then that's what you do is you bring in other people to that's take right. care of your busy work. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So I've actually used examine.com before. Giddy and, up. Uh, yeah, so. I like about it is Does it suck or is it awesome? Wow, wow. It's awesome. You have to ask. <laughs> I'm just joking, wow. bro. I'm just trying to mess with him. Wow. He's a college student. He's I so nervous right now. Just relax. I'm just messing with him, dude. Just, just messing with him. But yeah, the thing I like about it is that there's a lot of misinformation in the fitness industry, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. Yeah. And so do you think, uh, do you think like this counter industry of that, you know, getting the right information out there, do you think that's going to be something that's coming up in, in the uh, next years, in the future? or? I, I don't think it's about a coming up thing. I think it's, it's a reality that we need that. It's just the problem is it's not sexy, right? The food babe, for example, can be going around talking about how some ingredient is causing cancer because it sounds sexy. It's scary. So part of our problem always has been is we are a very boring organization. We can talk about MSG. We can talk about eggs, stuff like that. But we're not, again, we're not sexy. But what, what's happened is because we're an education company, Everyone who comes across us, our word of mouth tends to be absolutely terrific. So I do think there's definitely a role for this kind of stuff. But the other thing also is that scientists do not know how to communicate with humans. So my co-founder, brilliant guy, he can't use the word people. He uses the, words, he uses the word persons. I'd yell at him, no difference. I threatened to kill kittens, no difference. I started fining him $20 every time he used the word persons instead of people. We got to $200 within the first week and I just gave up. I just hired a copy editor. I'm like, I cannot take this anymore. So it's that translation of scientific communication that's a huge barrier. And my next project is pets. And literally, that's the exact same thing we're doing, right? We don't want to be like examines a little bit more of an encyclopedia. But we want to be able to communicate research to humans so they understand what's actually real and not what's just you know, hyped up and scary. That's awesome. One last one. Howdy. What advice do you have for bootstrappers that are going up against VC-funded companies and competition? At the end of the day, you have to focus, right? VC companies are always going for the big picture. They always have to show big revenue. You've got time. You don't need, because VCs are on a three to four year timeline, right? Usually actually even, even a bit shorter than that. They need bridge loans and stuff like that. So as long as you focus and you're generating revenue and the, the upside is there, that's really all there is about it. And then the rest will eventually ideally come anyway. Cool. Patience, I guess, is, is the one word succinct answer on that. Yeah, yeah. I've had nine years of patience. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, I'm very patient. And you know what? Hey, that's going to bring us to our next point, though, because you kind of pressed up against VC. But what's going to be fun this afternoon for us is we have a panel of VCs. So that's going to be tremendous. I can't wait to make that awkward tension. Oh, in I'm the definitely going to ask like questions that oh, make them feel terrible. It's going to just be exactly 100%. Like just a thumb war up in this thing. Oh, it's just so awkward. It's going to be quite be... brutal. Oh, it's so <laughs> it's awesome. Hey, can you guys thank Saul one more time? Thanks so much for coming, man. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. Yes.